welcome all of you here in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, to this wonderful time of the year, to this time of welcoming the light that is Jesus Christ into our lives. It's a little chilly in here tonight. Imagine what Mary and Joseph had to deal with. We at least have coats. They didn't. We are working on the heat. <laughs> but I'm glad to see all of you here this evening. And I pray that we will join together in, uh, in worshiping our Lord and Savior. Let us begin with a word of prayer, shall we? Almighty and most gracious Heavenly Father, as we enter into this time of joy and hope and love and peace, fill our hearts. Send your Holy Spirit upon us tonight. Reveal your Son to us in a new and exciting way. May we leave here tonight holding on to the light that we share, holding on to it forever and ever. We ask your blessing now in your Son, Jesus, most holy and precious name. Amen. Just stand and join us for joy to the world. Thank you. 
God, our Father, you have brought us again to the glad season when we celebrate the birth of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Grant that his Spirit may be born anew in our hearts this day, and that we may joyfully welcome him to reign over us. Open our ears that we may hear again the angelic chorus of old. Open our lips that we may sing with uplifted hearts. Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, good will toward all. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. But you, Bethlehem, Epaphras, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Listen to Paul's wonderful words to Titus as he explains the reason for Christ's coming. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of your great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. Tonight we light the Christ candle. We rejoice in Jesus Christ, the light of the world. Let us pray. Almighty God, this is the eve of the day in which we celebrate the birth of your son, Jesus. For it is our salvation that he came. We give you thanks and praise for your act of divine love by sending him to us. Amen. From John 1, verses 1 through 4. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. Thank you. 
Genesis 2, verse 8 through 17. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat from it, you will certainly die. Wow, everybody's really, everybody's really dressed uh, pretty sharp tonight, I would say. Something going on that I don't know about? What? This might be loud now. Nope. That's right, yeah. So have you guys been making a lot of preparations for Christmas? Anything special you're doing? What's, what kind of preparation are you guys doing? John? That's a good answer. <laughs> and what kind of preparation? How about your parents? Are they doing a lot of stuff? Yeah? Probably running around in circles, right? No, Morgan, they're not? They can hear you, you know. Okay, <laughs> you guys notice anything about the, the slide up there for the children's message? I think he did. <laughs> what does it say? Yeah. Right. Mary spelled wrong. Where's Linda? You know what? I told her put up Merry Christmas. And M E R R Y. Boy, that oh man, that goofs up my whole message now. All right. Well, guess what? Guess what? The mic's on. <laughs> I actually had. Linda put up their M-A-R-Y Christmas. You guys have any idea? Why? No?
That's right. But guess what? This is a different Mary. Okay? So I'm going to tell you a little story from Luke, okay? Um, at this time, Jesus was traveling around with his disciples, and there was a lady named Martha that invited the disciples and Jesus to come stay at her house. So uh, Jesus was there, and he was talking to Martha's sister, whose name is Mary. Okay, so this is a different Mary. This isn't Mary and Joseph. Th this isn't uh, Jesus' mother. Um, and Mary was sitting at Jesus' feet, just like you guys are sitting out here, listening to Jesus. And Martha was getting, you know, stressed out because she was making preparations and things like that. So she came out to Jesus, and she said, can you get Mary to come in and help me? She's just sitting here. She's not doing anything. So Martha was kind of hollering at Jesus. That's not a good thing, right? <laughs> I wouldn't think so. And what do you think Jesus said to Martha? He says, Martha, Martha, there's only one thing that's needed right now, and Mary has chosen the right thing. Okay? See, Mary wanted to spend time with Jesus. She, she wanted to be in his presence. Okay? And Martha was worried about things that really didn't matter at this point because Jesus was, Jesus was there. I would hope if Jesus came to visit you, you would be with him, right? Not worrying about getting everything else done. Okay? You remember uh, when we first started Advent, Pastor Tim, I think it was the first Sunday in Advent, when he talked about the one, okay? And that's what, when Jesus said there's only one thing that's needed, what do you think he meant by the one thing? Well, G Jesus himself. Okay, that's what they needed. So the point I want to make is not to get stressed out or worry about all the preparations that need to be done for Christmas. We should be putting our minds and hearts on the one thing that really matters, which is, which is uh, Jesus. Okay? All right, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, ask for a blessing on these children this evening uh, in Luke Jesus said, let the children come to me. And that's our prayer for tonight, that these children will come to you. Uh, we bless their parents for bringing them to church and for teaching them about you at home. And I pray that everyone here has a merry, M-A-R-Y, Christmas. Amen. Our current reading is from Exodus 20, 1 through 17. And God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of Egypt, out of the hand of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourselves, yourself an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not hold anyone guiltless who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day by keeping it holy. Six days you shall labor, and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, neither you, nor your son or daughter, nor your male or female servant, nor your animals, nor any foreigner residing in your towns. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them. But he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the, seventh, the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, so that you may live long in the land the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet, covet your neighbor's wife or his male or female servant, 
his ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. reading from 1 Kings, chapter 16, verses 29 through 34. In the 38th year of Asa, king of Judah, Ahab, son of Omri, became king of, king of Israel, and he reigned in Samaria over Israel 22 years. Ahab, son of Omri, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. He not only considered it trivial to commit the sins of of Jeroboam, son of Nebat, but he also married Jezebel, daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and began to serve Baal and worship him. He set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to arouse the anger of the Lord, the God of Israel, than did all the kings of Israel before him. In Ahab's time, Hiel of Bethel rebuilt Jericho. He laid its foundations at the cost of his firstborn son, Abiram, and he set up its gates at the cost of his youngest son, Segub, in accordance with the word of the Lord spoken by Joshua, son of Nun. reading is from Isaiah 9, 2 through 7. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest, as warriors rejoice when dividing the plunder. For as in the day of Midian's defeat, you have shattered the yoke 
that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for the fire. For unto us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Scripture lesson is from Luke 2, 1 through 20. It's the word of God. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee and Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house of and line of David, 
He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no guest room available to them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to the God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby, who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured all, up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. It's the word of God for the people of God. You're probably wondering... Why were all those Old Testament scriptures read tonight? This is Christmas Eve. Why are we reading about the Ten Commandments? Why were we reading about Adam and Eve? Why? Have you ever thought about that? Why does the Christ child have to to come. Why? John 1.1 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word and the Word was with God. In the beginning the Word was with God. The Word, Jesus Christ, was with God along with the Holy Spirit creating, creating the universe, creating the earth, creating the air and the sea and the sky and the fish and the land animals and Adam and Eve. It was a perfect place. Everything was perfect. There was enough food for them to eat forever and never go hungry. Enough water to drink and never thirst. It was perfect, and the only thing they had to do was tend to it. They had one rule to follow, one rule. You must not eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. One rule. Now we know the story. Genesis 3, Eve is tempted by the serpent. And where's my confirmation class? It's not a, it's not an apple, thank you. And what else is in it? It's not a snake. It's a serpent. My confirmation class knows that's a pet peeve of mine. Eve is tempted by the serpent, and she eats of the fruit, right? We all know that story. And she hands it to her husband, Adam, and he eats it, and he is the caretaker of the rule, and he eats of the fruit. And because they disobeyed, they are kicked out of the perfect place. 
and now he must till the land and she must bear child with pain. This sets off a firestorm of sinful behavior, doesn't it? The next story we read is about Cain and Abel, and Cain kills Abel, and, and it just goes on like this for a while, and, and the Lord is, 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 you know, slowly but surely becoming, you know, disenchanted and angry with the, his creation. So he sends Noah, and we know the story of Noah and the flood. Go. And the flood destroys all the land and destroys all the people except for eight. Eight people survive on the ark, right? And isn't it interesting that not very long after the story of Noah, the people sin again. And they keep sinning. And ultimately, they end up in Egypt, which is kind of a weird thing. And they end up in bondage, don't they? So God sends Moses to them. And Moses, of course, you know, frees them, gets them freed from captivity and he you know, moves them into the desert and he goes up on a mountain where God speaks directly to him and gives him not one rule now, but ten rules. A little more difficult this time. But before Moses can even get off the mountain, before he can even begin to deliver the message of the Ten Commandments, the Israelites have already sinned by making a golden calf. So for 40 years, they wander around in the desert. Joshua then leads them out of the desert and into the land that God promised them. Again, a nearly perfect land. And God had defeated all their enemies before them. And he had performed miracle after miracle. The spreading of the Red Sea, the providing of manna and quail from heaven. And it doesn't take long. When they enter the promised land, they begin sinning again. Greed, lust, hunger for power. All these things that God does not want any of us to do, they quickly fell into. And then they decide on their own that they want a king. This is not God's idea. This is their idea. They want a king. And so God, he says, look, I'll give you a king, but here's what's going to happen. And he laid it right out there. Kings are going to lust after power. They're going to lead you down the wrong path. And sure enough, they do. Tonight we read about Ahaz, and he was one of the worst. That's why I picked him. He was a king Judah, too, which is even worse. The kings of Israel were all bad, but... To have a king in Judah be as bad as that was just the breaking point. So God calls on the Babylonians and the Assyrians and, and drives the Israelites into exile. Even when they are given the opportunity to come back to rebuild the temple. It's not long after their freedom that once again they begin to worship false idols, false gods. What is God supposed to do? How is he supposed to get through to these people? There was only one way. Because the people sin, because we sin, God cannot be in relationship with us. God cannot be in the same place as sin. And therefore, somehow, because he loved his creation so much, because he wanted a relationship with us so much, he had to 
had to come with a way, come up with a way that we could have our sins cleansed. And all the sacrifices and all the rituals and all the, 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 the praying and whatever was not making it. So God sends his son, Jesus Christ, whose life we celebrate here tonight. Cardinal Dolan, in an interview with NBC the other day, Cardinal Dolan is the Archbishop of New York or something like that in the Catholic Church. But he made a great statement, and I agree 100% with him. We walk in darkness, don't we? We, we look around at the news and we look at our, our, our government and we look at, 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 at our situations around the world with Ukraine and, and, the, and the amount of poverty and homelessness and, and, and all of these horrible things that we see on the news every night. And we think, oh my goodness, isn't there any hope whatsoever? Isn't there a brightness somewhere that we can hold on to, that we can grab hold of? And Cardinal Dolan says, Jesus Christ is that light. And he's right. That is the light. The light that comes into the world that gives you and I hope, peace and joy and love. God didn't want to have to do this, but it was the only way that you and I could receive salvation. The only way you and I could receive forgiveness. The only way you and I could receive redemption was through the Son, Jesus Christ. God sent several prophets ahead of Christ to tell us that this was going to happen. And we read some of that tonight in Isaiah 9, 6. He says, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. And then in verse 7, he says, he will reign on David's throne and over the kingdom from that time on and forevermore. If you look at the lineage in the Bible of Jesus the Christ, you will see it goes directly back to David. And we even learn from Micah where Christ will be born. Micah 5.2 says, Bethlehem Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel whose origins are from of old, ancient times. The prophecies lead us to this night. The prophecies show us that Jesus is the one who came to share and to be the light. Why? Why do we celebrate tonight? Why? It's a baby born in a barn for crying out loud. We have trouble celebrating our own children's birthdays, yet we're celebrating a birthday that has lasted over 2,000 years. No other person on earth has accomplished as much as Jesus Christ did. No billionaire ever in the world could provide the hope that Jesus Christ provides for you and me. No president or king can provide the peace that is offered by Jesus Christ on this very night. And no person, no person in all the world can give you the love that Jesus Christ gave you through his birth, life, and death, and resurrection. Isaiah tells us the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, light has dawned. Tonight, tonight we are going to take that light. We're 
We're going to take that light and we're going to share it with one another. We're going to offer it to one another in peace and hope and, and love. But what I want you to do is I want you to take that light tonight. And when you leave this place, I want you to share it with everyone you meet. Share it with the store clerks. Share it with the people you work with. Share it with the people you meet on the street. Even if you never find out their name, share it with them. Let this be a light that lights the world and allows the darkness to fade away and the light to shine through. The ushers, please come forward.
This is the night that we stand with the angels and we sing hallelujah, glory to God on high. And we call all Christians to come to the light. Why Christ came to bring light into the world, to a world that was filled with darkness and hopelessness. Let your light shine. And may God bless us and keep us. May he make his face to shine upon us and be gracious unto us. And may his light in our hearts and minds and souls never go out. In his name we pray. Amen. From my family to yours, we wish you a blessed and merry Christmas and a blessed and happy new year. May we all rejoice in joy to the world.